Well, good morning, church family. So we're so excited to have you with us again. Will you stand to your feet? I want to read you uh, an encouragement, if that's okay. Um, this is actually, if you're in the kindergarten class, this is part of your memory verse for the week. But this comes uh, from the Psalm uh, 32. And, and the psalmist David says this, Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin has been put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. When I hid my sin, my body felt like I was wasting away. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. But when I confessed my sin and stopped trying to hide my guilt, he forgave me and all my guilt is gone. Therefore, let us pray while there's still time that we may not drown in waves of self-judgment no, but you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance and victory. The Lord guides me, advises me, and watches over me. Your unfailing love surrounds those who trust the Lord. So rejoice in the Lord and be glad. All, um, all you who trust in him, shout for joy and sing all you whose hearts have been made pure. How many of you know uh, it's so like us and we can see it in our children, we do it ourselves. So many times we hide from God, but the scripture says it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. And so wherever you're coming from today, we pray that you would draw closer to him and find him today. There is no life without you. You have all that we need. Where you are, every fear is broken. And the darkness must flee. No 
Man, who wants to go deeper with Jesus this morning? Amen. I plan to do the same thing. I'll tell you a story very quickly. Uh, there was these two guys sitting on a uh, park bench. Here, take a seat. Please take a seat. Sorry, I got to... Jackson does this so much better than I do. He's been doing it for a while, by the way. I think since 1859 or something. There were these two guys sitting on a park bench. These two older gentlemen sitting on a park bench. And they're just they're talking about life as old people do. They're sitting down talking about life. And they see these two people, these two young people across them, kissing and they're just romantically kissing on this other bench. And the old men, Bob and Gus, look at each other and Bob says to Gus, oh, that is disgusting. Can you believe these young people these days? And Gus is like, unbelievable. And Bob is like, I didn't kiss my wife until it was our wedding day. Did you? He turns to Gus and says, did you? And Gus says, well, it all depends. Uh, what's your wife's maiden name again? It's all about context, isn't it, friends? It's all about context. Stuff is going on in the world, but you need to understand that God is truly in control. And if you're reading your Bibles, you will see that though it may seem quite difficult right now, challenging, and there are other words you can think that will describe what you're feeling, but the reality is Jesus is coming back. And that's the truth, and that's the context in which we are living in. We won't suffer for long, amen? All right, I want to, speaking of old people, I want to call up Jackson for a second, and uh, we're just going to get him to come and help us with the announcements. Ladies and gentlemen, Jackson. <laughs> oh, I'm pay morning, for that. Nick. <laughs> okay, mate. I'm just keeping a distance. I feel like you're going to hurt me. Yeah, I'm going to keep working you until you're all off the other side of the stage. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. How are you? A few announcements, but first, let, let's just bow our heads for a moment of prayer, okay? Father in heaven. It is a privilege to be here in this house of the worship with you today. We thank you for sending your Holy Spirit. We, we pray, Lord, that it will not just fill this room, but that the Holy Spirit will fill our hearts. Yes, Lord. And as we worship you today in, in every way that we do, we pray, Lord, that we will keep in mind that you are coming soon. Yeah. That you love us, that you want to to use us to further your work. And mm. so today, may we learn another way that we can further your work in this service today. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, hey, uh, just a quick shout out to Marcus and Gwen. They told us they're watching online this morning from Loma Linda. We love you guys. Thank you for tuning in. And to all of you who are tuning in live on Facebook and YouTube, it's, I'm so glad that you're with us. And, and those who are uh, here, obviously, in person, we're super excited. Thank you for being part of this worship service. What's coming up? Um, well, we've got some membership transfers. We've got a first reading happening. So um, I stole your little... How can we serve you more? Did you, do you want? Go ahead. Go ahead. If we can serve you better. Uh, we have some connection. <laughs> we have some connection cards uh, directly in front of you guys. So please connect with us. Tell us how we can support and love you in all the right ways. Um, you're thinking about making this your, your church home. Please fill out the details and we can start a, uh, a membership transfer for you. If you'd like Bible studies, if you'd like to be baptized, or if you just want to know more about what we're doing here, what this movement is all about, please give us your details and we'll be in contact with you super quickly. Now... We have a few membership transfers, and if we can think to settle back to where it needs to be, a little help, Jessica. I'm not getting it to work right. Okay, outgoing transfers. We have a couple of first readings. Uh, Janilda, so Janilda Sosa from Southwest uh, to Southwest City Company in Southwest City, Missouri. Anybody been to? I, I went happened to slide through Southwest City, Missouri one day. Okay. On a motorcycle ride. You cannot get any further southwest in the state of Missouri than that. It literally is on the state line right so now. So why would they leave, Jackson? What's going on? I don't know. It's pretty country over there. So yeah, I guess okay. So. Well, Matt and Anka, on Anka Dower have found a, a new church home in Roseburg, Oregon. All of you are familiar with Matt and Anka. They were with us for a number of years. They found a new church home out there in Catherine Perry. He'll be transferring, has asked for a membership to go to the first church over in Tulsa. Also, some incoming Estes Marks from Kingsboro uh, Temple in Brooklyn, New York. Woo. Heather Walburn from Ritzville, Washington. And our own Sarah Wagner, Sarah's not with us today, uh, from the Garnett Spanish Church. These are first readings. Next week, we will have second readings on those. Excellent. Thank you. 
did that so well. Um, regarding the uh, God's Angels serving Tulsa Homes Ministry, you have some information, some details on your bulletin. Apparently, that's incorrect. So please just check the slides that we're playing right now. This is the right information. So we are there on August the 29th at 2 p.m. So if you want to get involved with that, that's when we're meeting, and that's where it's at. The Thank you. The correction on that is the address on it. So make note of the address at 252 West 17th Place. That is the correct address. There was a misspelling, in it, or a, a, just a, a typo in the bulletin. Also, tomorrow, Jeffrey is with us. My, uh, Mariah and Jeff are expecting twins. Wow. I'm having a shower for them. Yeah, there are some, there are some issues going on right now. Mariah's in the hospital, mm -hmm. so we want to make sure that we keep that family mm. very high on our prayer list. But there we will continue to, uh, the scheduled pr shower for them will be tomorrow at uh, 3 to 5 here at the church. So come on by, drop in if you can't stay for long. Um, and if you can, great, they'll have some snacks and things here. But come on by and, and bless them with, uh, with some gifts there for their kids. I think that they'd, they'd appreciate that. Fantastic. All right, Tulsa Day Center serving our community continues. And so please be a part of that. Um, we're leaving at 5 p.m. from um, this church today, and it truly really is an incredible ministry. So if you haven't done it yet, you, you want to get involved in that, we have an opportunity to bless the many people in our community who are in desperate need of some basics like food, for example. And so that today at uh, 5.30, we'll leave from here, and we'll start at 6 o'clock at the community center. If you would like more information than that, um, please come speak to any of the, um, uh, the, greet, the greeting team or the elders here today. Our offering today is for local church advance, or local conference advance. The, the local ch conference advance is, is are, are funds that, that are discretionary funds for the conference to be able to use for, for, for projects that, that they see fit with. Our, our conference supports us very well in, in our efforts here at Adventist Fellowship, and it's an opportunity for us to, to just repay some of that and, and to thank them for their support. So that is our... our our emphasis today, don't forget your local church offerings, your tithes, the, the, the projects that are going on here with our, our ministries here at church. We're very thankful for the, for the generosity of our congregation, and, and we just pray that you are blessed by blessing us. Amen. So at this time, the deacons have come forward. We just ask that we bow our heads for a moment and ask for God's blessing on this offering. Father... It is a privilege, Lord. And, and sometimes we think that we're just paying you or we're paying back. But in reality, Lord, it's yours. And we ask that you will help us to, to be able to give with a sharing heart. That we can, that we can share and, and, and know that it is a blessing. So we ask this morning that you will bless this offering. Bless those who give. Those who are struggling right now to give. Lord, may you bless the widow's might hmm. as well as the rich man's gift. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, we love seeing your faithfulness in what matters, and partnering with us to advance the gospel absolutely matters. At this point, you're wondering how to. Good question. We've made it easier for you. We have two ways to give. You can give online or by mail. If you'd like to give by mail, please send your gift to Adventist Fellowship at P.O. Box 691539, Tulsa, Oklahoma 74169. Now, if you're giving online, make sure to use a device that's not currently streaming at the moment or it will compromise your streaming. Then, pull up your navigation app of preference, like Safari or Chrome, and go to the search box on the top and type in adventistgiving.org. Press enter, and then it will take you to the home screen with a search box in the center. Type Adventist Fellowship, and then select Adventist Fellowship when it appears. Then you'll see a giving category screen with different items where you can enter the amount you'd like to give and follow the screen prompts. Thank you for partnering with us in the advancement of God's kingdom. God bless you. Amen. It's good to be a cheerful giver. Amen. 
And you know who makes this really cheerful to give to? Our young people. So children, if you're here, come down and get your pocket because uh, we know we have members that want to bless you. This morning, this goes towards our children's ministry. And when we're done, we're going to put our pockets back in the back and we're going to dismiss our young people to children's church today. So young people, come right up front. There's a bucket right up here up front. You can get your pockets, your little rainbow pockets. You can help us pick up the offering for our children's church. And parents, grandparents, loved ones, will you hold those those dollar bills or those $5 or $10 bills up nice and high so our children can spot you and, and take that offering this morning? over here. Thank you so much, church family, for blessing our little ones. And kiddos, when we're done, if you want to go make your way back to this back door here, you can drop off your pocket. And Miss Anita is standing there with a smile and a wave there. She's going to take you to Children's Church today. Church family, we invite you to stand back with us as we continue in our worship service.
so many good so many good lines in that song just a reminder to us that he is lord of all that we can place our hope in him scripture says that our hope is hidden in him hidden in jesus he's an eternal hope for us regardless of what we might see in our lives or in the world we have hope in him we invite you right where you are to take a seat as we enter this time of prayer and know that God is near, uh, that he's, his ear is inclined toward you. And we just ask you to meditate as we sing this next song.
family, it's now time to uh, seek our Father together in prayer. And if you're able to, I invite you to kneel or stay seated or stand, um, whatever you choose. Let us pray together. And so our Father, we want to pause for a moment and just thank you so much for being a wonderful, loving, patient, merciful God. I want to thank you for the opportunity and privilege we have here in Tulsa, Lord, to come together as often, Lord, as possible, just to seek you, to connect with each other, and to praise your name. And so, Lord, this morning we praise you because, Father, we are here. We have the strength and courage to open our hearts and our minds to you. And I know, Father, for many people this week, it has been super difficult with the many challenges that come with this life. Still, Father, we thank you for leading us through, for holding our hands and sometimes picking us up. Father, I just wanna thank you personally, Lord, for this incredible uh, church families that we have here, the members, our visitors, this Tulsa community. Father, I know that you're doing something amazing and wonderful in this place. We sit with our eyes. We are seeing people, Lord, turn their lives around because of your spirit. We are seeing people, Lord, make decisions and commitments to you, Lord, now and forevermore. We thank you for that, Father. And so, Lord, as a community of believers, we come together this morning to ask that you continue to dwell with us and be with our friends and our families, with us, Lord for the hurt, the pain that we go through, the illnesses, the uncertainty that we face too often, Lord, in this world. We're thankful, Lord, for the uh, the aid that is going out to Haiti at this time, Father. And I pray that you continue to bless the men and the women, Father, who go out to seek those who are literally, Father, lost and those who are in desperate need of food and shelter and care. Father, I ask that you be with the many families, Lord, who have lost their loved ones in Afghanistan just of late. Father, it seems like COVID is lingering still. And so we just pray as we try to make sense of everything, Lord, that you may help us and remind us that you are with us. This body may fail and things may fall apart around us but our hearts and our minds are with you always and you are with us always and you promise and you promise never to leave us. So Lord, this morning I wanna bring to you our brother Marcus in prayer. Father, as he prepares for surgery this week, be with him, help him to trust you. Thank you so much for the faith that he has in you, Lord. And we ask that you may continue to do this wonderful work in his life. Be with the physicians and his wonderful wife, Gwen, Lord, as she supports him through this. Lord, that they may experience victory in you. Father, we're thinking of Sean as well at this time and ask that you bless him, Lord, and give him the wisdom that he needs to trust you with his life and those who are attending to him right now in hospital. We ask that you be with Mr. Lamb, Lord, and his wife. Father, who is a dear friend to our members here, and I pray that you bless him today in a special way, that you may look after him, Father, as he seems to be declining and... and, uh, And in his illness, Lord, we we fear that he might pass away. We pray, Father, that your will may be done in his life. We ask for a miracle today. Lord, we also wanna pray for Pastor Nathan. Yes, so blessed to have him here with us this morning. And we look forward to the the words of life that he is to share with us. And just pray that you may pour your spirit into his life, Lord, that he may speak to us. Lord, that you may speak to us. Thank you, Father, for the many people who are here, Lord, who bring their petitions to you this morning. I don't know every prayer request, Lord, but you do. And together as a family, we ask these things, therefore, in Jesus' name. Amen. And in response to our prayers, 
Can we just sing together and just declare his goodness that we have a good father who cares for us? Tender 
How are you doing today? If you believe God is a good, good father, why don't you say amen? Amen. Now, uh, my name is Pastor Nathan Shires. Um, I pastor one of our uh, um, other Seventh-day Adventist church campuses over in Claremore, Oklahoma. And recently, I've uh, acquired a, a second church in Pryor. And I've been here at least once before, and I see some familiar faces as I look around, but uh, there's also some faces I don't recognize, so it is good to be with you today, it's good to meet you today. And speaking of God being a good, good father, I believe that with all my heart, but I've also been blessed to have a very good earthly father. And uh, some of you might know him, for most of my life, uh, growing up here in Oklahoma, He was the only Pastor Shires here in Oklahoma. And what he said, Pastor Shires was my dad, not me. And uh, until about three and a half years ago, my wife and I moved back to Oklahoma from Tennessee, and uh, we started pastoring our own church district. And now there's Elder Shires and Pastor Shires here in Oklahoma. And I'm really blessed to be able to work in a conference where I get to see my dad regularly. But here's the thing about growing up as the son of a pastor. One of the things. There's a lot of things I could say, but here's one of the things about growing up as the son of a pastor. You move around a lot. It's kind of like military families. We saw almost every corner of the state throughout my lifetime. And uh, as we moved around, sometimes life can feel a little lonely. You're in a church full of people but you've just moved there and you don't know anyone. You don't have any friends there yet. You go to a new school and there's a lot of students, a lot of peers around you, but you feel alone because you don't know any of them yet. You haven't built the friendships that they've built for years. And feeling alone can be a very awful feeling. Have any of you ever felt alone before? I mean, as some of you are saying, what are you talking about, Pastor Nathan? 2020, we were isolated from our friends and our families. All of us felt alone at times in 2020. But there's something that's worse than feeling alone, and that is feeling alone while you're in a very dangerous situation. And that can be pretty terrifying. But if you've ever felt alone, if you've ever felt alone in a dangerous situation, or if you've ever felt alone and disconnected from God, I want to start today by sharing a Bible promise with you. And I want to ask that you take out your Bibles and look it up with me. Uh, it's in 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 22. Whether you have an electronic Bible or a, a uh, uh, hard copy, open up your Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 22. If you've ever felt lonely, disconnected from God, um, here is a Bible promise that's just for you today. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 22. This is our key text for the message today, and it says, give you a moment to turn there, 1 Samuel 12, verse 22. Here's what it says. For the Lord will not forsake his people. I want you to say just that part with me. For the Lord will not forsake his people. Let's break it into parts. You repeat after me. For the Lord will not, I need a little more response here this morning, forsake his people. That's better. This is what it says. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you his people. Here's a personal story about a time when I was alone in a dangerous situation. It was about 11 o'clock, 11 p.m. on a summer night in 2013. And I was in Brooklyn, New York City, sitting alone on the floor of a very old, very large building in a darkened hallway. Now, some of you already are not liking where this story is going. You're like, why? Why were you alone at 11 o'clock at night in an enormous building in a dark hallway? Well, that's a good question. 
And that's the first important question. You see, I was working with a ministry that summer, and we spent three weeks in Brooklyn, New York City, and I was with a group of about 20 other young people, and we were staying in this very large old building while we were there. Here's a few things you need to know about that building. Number one, it was once a convent, and it had been purchased by the Seventh-day Adventist Church and had become a Seventh-day Adventist school. Now, this was a very old building. It was at least 100 to 200 years old. And the architecture of this building gave off a very eerie feeling just as you looked at it and as you walked through it. I mean, there were gargoyles on the corners of the rooftop. There were long, dark hallways on every one of the seven levels. There were um, sometimes on the hallways fluorescent, dim, fluorescent flickering lights as you walked down the hallways. And the bottom two levels had been renovated, but every level you went up from that, it was more and more dilapidated. And you just felt like as you walked through this building that someone or something was going to jump out from any corner at any moment and grab you. I mean, it was a very eerie building. And it was such an old building that at night, everything creaked and groaned and just was, everything about it was, was a pretty creepy building to be in. So the seven levels were connected by a central staircase that, that went up in the, in the center of it. And in this building, there were two caretakers and our 20, our team of 20 college-age students, they were staying on the first two levels along with the caretakers. And I happened to be the, uh, uh, running this program at the time, and so the caretakers put me in a room on the third floor. It's the only one on the third floor in a room. And uh, so I could have a little bit of privacy as I worked on some of the projects I needed to as the leader. So now we're back to where we started. About 11 o'clock at night, sitting in this, the hallway, the dark hallway of this old, creepy building. And I'm sitting on the floor beside the central staircase because that was the only place where I could get wireless internet in the building. So I'm working on my computer, and I'm working on a project, getting wireless internet, and the only light on my entire floor was from the staircase. And so it's, it's creating a dim light that I can look down both directions and I can see it gets darker and darker as it goes in both directions about um, uh, 30 yards each way. And I can barely make out the end of each of the two hallways. And so as I'm sitting there typing, I think I hear a sound, some creaking coming from the end of the hallway to my left. So I look up from my computer screen, and as my eyes adjust, as I'm staring down the hallway, I can see the hallway disappearing, and then you can, I can see the, the door frame, the silhouette of a door frame of an open door, and beyond that, it is pitch black. I mean, I'm, I'm staring into it to see if I can see anything, because that's where the creaks are coming from, but I can't penetrate the black void beyond this doorway. And so I think to myself, well, it's just an old building. It makes noises, right? And so I go back to typing. Then I hear it again. This time it sounds a little bit closer inside the room at the end. And so I look up from my computer again and I stare down into the doorway. Nothing, can't see, just pitch black. But the creaking stops, so I go back to typing. And then I hear it again. So about 10 minutes goes by, and, and I go through this little routine. I keep working, and I hear it, and I look up. And each time, the creak sounds like it's a little closer than it was the time before. And then it stopped. Now, I don't know what set my nerves more on edge, hearing the creaking sound getting closer and closer, or all of a sudden, it abruptly stopping. But it stopped, and so I look up from my computer screen. I dim the computer screen, and now I just stare down the hallway into that, the, the dark void of that doorway. And, and we have, I'm telling you, we have a staring match. I mean, 10 minutes at least. I have no idea how long it was, but I'm just staring intently into this doorway. And I look down the hall to the other side, and I see my room about halfway down the hallway in case I need to make a quick exit. But I'm staring, and I don't hear anything. So then I think to myself, I should say something. And I think, okay, the only thing I can hear right now is my heart pounding in my chest. But I think I should, I should say something. You just set my nerves at each. No one's really there, right? So I'm so I staring into this darkness and I say, I think, 
stay calm, sound tough, be in control. But I swear this is what came out. I said, hello? hello? Is there anybody there? Silence. I say it one more time. Hello? hello? Nothing. <sighs> but then, all of a sudden, the silence is interrupted by a very deep voice that replies, Hello? Oh my goodness. I was not expecting that. I mean, talk about an adrenaline rush. I mean, my heart stopped beating. All of the cliches you can think of happened to me in that moment. Hair on the back of my neck stands up. And I just think that, you know, it's, it's difficult to describe exactly what was going on in my mind at that moment. It was kind of jumbled. But it was something between my mind screaming at me, run, you idiot! And on the other side, there was this feeling that I needed to stay calm, I needed to stay cool, I needed to stay collected, because if I just got up and ran, whoever was there was going to run after me and attack me. So I I got this conflict going on inside of me, and I I just think, who do you turn to at a moment like this? Friends downstairs, um, police, um, get ready to fight my own way out of it, rely on myself. But in that moment, fortunately, I had the sense that I started by saying a quick little prayer silently in my head. I said, dear Lord Jesus, please protect me from whatever is inside that room. And then I did what everyone would have done. I asked a follow-up question. (laughs) Now, I don't even know what was going through my mind. It was difficult to formulate words, but here's what I said. I said, uh, do do, do you sleep in there? (laughs) After a pause, the voice responded again. Same deep voice said, sometimes. Oh my goodness. Okay, I was done. I I was done. So I closed my computer screen. I said, okay, good night. Got up, stood up, briskly walked down the hallway towards where my room was, got to the door, opened the door, and I've never gone through a doorway so fast in my life. I've never shut a doorway so fast behind me in my life. And I'm telling you, I found everything that was inside that room and barricaded the doorway. I mean, we're talking desks. We're talking book boxes of old books. We're talking um, whiteboards, everything. I, I barricaded that doorway. And there in my room, how do you go to sleep after an experience like that. And so I'm laying there in my bed and, and I'm thinking, I'm praying to God and I'm claiming every Bible promise I could think of. And I'm like, I'm like, dear Lord, I'm like, it says in the Bible that, that uh, the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous will run to it and be safe. And I'm thinking, the angel of the Lord, yes, Lord, your angel encamps round about those who fear him and delivers them. And then I'm thinking, oh, Lord, here's a good one for you. Remember this one. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Lord, green pastures sound so good right now. He makes me to lie down, or he leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. And then I remember that line, Yea, Lord, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And sometime, I don't know how long or when, I finally did drift off to sleep that night. And I got to give you a spoiler alert. I did survive the night. I know some of you were really wondering. I did survive that night. But here's the thing. Now I can assure you, I'm going I'm to finish this story before the end of this sermon. But here's the thing about crises like this. Existential crises that come in your life. After the fact, sometimes it's easy to look back on these stories and you can see the humor in it. And you can laugh at it. And you can laugh at yourself in that moment. But when you're in the moment of an existential crisis or what you feel to be an existential crisis, it feels like life and death to you. And that can be a very terrifying feeling. So I want to turn to you for just a moment. I want you to think to a moment in your life where you were experienced a crisis. Maybe it was a financial crisis. Maybe it was a a family crisis. Maybe it was a health crisis. Maybe it was an existential crisis. And there's three important questions that I want to ask you that happened, that you did when you had this existential crisis in your life. The first is who? Who did you turn to in the moment of your crisis? 
The second question is what? What was it that helped you through that time of crisis? What carried you through it? The third question is why? Why did you respond the way that you did in your time of crisis? These are three very important questions as you're thinking back to the crisis in your life. Who did you turn to? What helped you? Why did you respond the way you did? And these are three questions that are going to help guide us through a Bible story today that's going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 28. So you're already in 1 Samuel. I want you to open to 1 Samuel chapter 28. And I want to look at a Bible story where a man named King Saul, who was Israel's first king, found himself in the greatest existential crisis of his life And I want to ask you these same three questions as we go through this story. Who did he turn to in his time of crisis? What was it that helped him? What help did he receive, perhaps, in that time of crisis? And why did he respond the way he did in this time of crisis? So 1 Samuel 28, we're going to look at a few verses through this story, and we're pretty much going to hang out here. So go ahead and turn there if you have your Bible with you today. And here's the thing. As I mentioned, 1 Samuel chapter 28, starting with verse 3, we have this man named King Saul, and we get a little bit of context that sets up this story in verse 3. Here it is. Look at it with me. It says, Now Samuel had died, and all Israel had lamented for him, and buried him in Ramah, in his own city. And Saul had put out the mediums and the spiritists out of the land. So here we have this story. Samuel, the great prophet who had anointed King Saul as king and who had been a mentor to him for much of his life, had died and he was buried. And then it gives you another little detail. Throughout the reign of King Saul, he had, he had been on a mission to put out the mediums and spiritists from the land. That is those who claim to communicate with the spirits of the dead. Why did he do that? Well, if you are a note taker today, I want you to jot down this Bible passage I have for you, and you can look it up later, but he was fulfilling Deuteronomy chapter 18, 9 through 12. Let me read an excerpt from that passage. Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 12. You can jot down the note now. Here's an excerpt. God had said to Israel, when you come into the land which the Lord your God has given you, the land of Canaan, he says, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. They, there shall not be found among you anyone who practices, listen to this, witchcraft, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. Why not, God? Well, he tells us, for all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. That's First Samuel, I'm sorry, that's Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 12. So King Saul had been on a mission to fulfill God's word So what was the crisis in his life? That's a little bit of background context that'll help us understand the story. What was the crisis? Look down at verse four. The story continues. It says in verse four and five, then the Philistines gathered together and came and encamped at Shunem. So Saul gathered all Israel together and they encamped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart greatly trembled. For King Saul, in this Bible passage, the crisis was here, and he was not ready for it. Saul had heard reports that the vast Philistine army had gathered and assembled, and he knew where their encampment was. And as he heard the report of how vast this army was, he was afraid. And then when he set up his own camp and prepared the line of defenses, he looked with his own eyes across the the most bitter enemies in their vast encampment that was lined out before him, and he was absolutely terrified. The crisis was here, and he was not ready. And in that moment, Saul was never more aware of the absence of God in his life than as he stared along the long line of all of the Philistine soldiers. Here's the thing. When a person comes face to face with their mortality and they are not prepared for the judgment, death can be a terrifying prospect. And that was the experience King Saul was having. So here's our first underlying question. Who? Who did Saul turn to in his time of crisis? 
Got to look at verse six. The story says, and when Saul inquired of the Lord, praise God, he started by inquiring of the Lord. He started out right, but there was a problem. It says the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by Urim or by prophets. So here's the thing about a crisis. When a crisis comes into our lives, as Saul stood face to face with this crisis, crises reveal who you are connected to. They reveal who matters most in your life, who you get your strength from. And in this crisis, Saul realized who he was not connected to. He was on the edge of the greatest crisis of his life and he discovered that there was a void in his life. It was a void of the spirit of God. It was a void of the word of God. It was a void of the power of God. And Saul cried out to the Lord, but the silence on the other end was absolutely deafening. In silence, King Saul had time to reflect over his life. How did he get here? Now, at my church, we've been going through a series on 1 Samuel, and we've been covering some of the great stories, and I don't have time to cover the whole story with you. We kind of built up to this at my church, but here's three biblical passages, three verses that can help you understand how Saul got here. You can jot them down. I'm just going to highlight them. Actually, there's four little sections. Saul thought back over his life, and he remembered how he had been called by God to be Israel's first king. He remembered the day as Samuel had poured the anointing oil over his head, and how he was filled with the Spirit of God, and it says God gave him a new heart. Saul also remembered the words of the prophet Samuel on the day of his coronation. In 1 Samuel 12, 21 and 22, this is where we have that promise that I shared with you at the beginning. If you're ever feeling alone, Samuel had given Saul some words of encouragement, but also a warning to remember throughout his reign. Here it is, 1 Samuel 12, 21 and 22. It says, do not turn aside from following the Lord. It's a great warning. For then you would go after empty things which cannot profit or deliver you. For they are nothing. And then comes that beautiful promise. For the Lord will not forsake his people. For his great name's sake. Because it has pleased the Lord to make you his people. The day of his coronation, Samuel had, had given this, this warning with this beautiful promise that the Lord would never forsake his people. And Saul was one of God's people. So how did he get here to this moment where he's crying out to the Lord, knocking on the door of heaven, but there's silence. No one is opening the door. Well, as Saul reflected over his life, he remembered a time when he had turned aside from following the Lord. Pride and disobedience had caused him to turn aside. And Saul remembered the first time how the prophet Samuel had given him this rebuke in 1 Samuel 13, 13. He had said, you've done foolishly, Saul. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom forever, but now your kingdom shall not continue. Saul continued to reflect over his life, and he, he remembered that that's, as that first rebuke still stung, there was another one that was even more pointed. He remembered a second time he had turned aside from following the word of the Lord. It was when God had sent Saul to, to be his instrument of judgment upon a wicked nation, the Amalekites, and said, do not take any trophies of war because this is an act of judgment from God. But in that story, Saul had deliberately disobeyed God and Samuel had given him an even harsher rebuke in 1 Samuel 15, 23. He said, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Everybody say the sin of witchcraft. Say that one more time because I only heard three of you. Rebellion is as the, say, the sin of witchcraft. If you ever want to feel how God feels about it, he tells him the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness, he says, is as the iniquity of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. From that day on, it was all downhill in the story of King Saul. Saul repeatedly had turned aside from the word of the Lord. He repeatedly resisted the spirit of the Lord. And in so doing, he had created a void in his life. In 1 Samuel 16, 14, it says that the spirit of the Lord had departed from King Saul. A void of the spirit of God. In his time of crisis, a void of the word of God. Frozen in place, a void of the power of God. Discovering 
the void of this, Saul turned from one void to another. The darkest void of all. The void of the bottomless pit. Look at what happens next in this story. We're still in 1 Samuel 28, verse 7. Saul now, as he realizes he's not getting an answer from God, he turns from the void of, having God in, of not having God in his life. And it says in verse 7, Then Saul said to his servants, Find me a woman who is a medium. He spent his entire life, the story says, driving them out of the land, fulfilling God's word. But now he says, find me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. Servants look at each other. They look back at him. He's serious. So they say to him, in fact, there is a woman who is a medium at Endor. Doesn't that just sound like a bad place? Endor. (laughs) There's a medium at Endor. Just sounds like he's going to a bad place, and he is. So the living king turns from the living God and goes to seek answers from the dead. Boy, what a tragedy. You continue the story, it says that he disguises himself. He steals away into the night with two of his servants. He goes into the residence of this medium woman in Endor, and in verse 11 through 13, look at this conversation that he has with the medium. Then the woman said, whom shall I bring up for you? Everybody say, bring up. I really want to hear you, all right? Everybody say, bring up. When the woman saw Sam, I'm sorry, so who shall I bring up? And Samuel says, or Saul says, bring up. Everybody say, bring up again. Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, it says, she cried out with a loud voice. And the woman spoke to Saul saying, why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. And the king said to her, do not be afraid. What did you see? Everybody repeat. What did you see? You see, this brings us to the second important question in this story. Second important question is what? Saul asks the right question. What do you see? The question is what? What help did Saul receive in his time of crisis? And he thinks it's coming from something or someone that only the medium who God says don't ever have any association with, only she can see and not him. So he asks, what can you see? And she answers him and says, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. Everybody say out of the earth. Second underlying question, what? What help did Saul receive in this time of crisis? He asked the right question, what do you see? And when you stare into the blackness of the void of necromancy, that is communication with the spirits of the dead, what do you see? When you knock on the doorway into this void, what is on the other side? When the doorway to the void cracks opened, What will come out to greet you? When you inquire of the void through mediums and spiritists, the question is not whose voice, but what voice will answer back. Just notice, Saul did not actually see Samuel. If you read through this whole story, only the woman did. He relied on her description and he only heard a voice. Let's keep going, verse 15. 1 Samuel 28, 15. It says, now Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me, bringing me up? This is the third question. Why? Why have you disturbed me? Why did Saul respond in his moment of crisis the way that he responded? Samuel asked him this question. Why are you here, Saul? Why did you disturb me, he says. And Saul gives us the answer. This brings us right to the very heart of this story. Why was Saul here? Saul answers this for us. He says, God has to, he says, I am deeply distressed for the Philistines make war against me and God has departed from me and does not answer me anymore, neither by prophet nor by dreams. Therefore, I have called you that you may reveal to me what I should do. Why did Saul respond in his moment of crisis the way he did? Why was he at Endor, in the residence of this medium, on the night before the greatest battle of his life, conducting a seance to try and contact the spirit of a dead prophet Samuel? Why had he ventured onto this forbidden ground? Why had he yet again disobeyed the command of the living God to have nothing to do with mediums and spiritists, necromancers, all who supposedly communicate with the spirits of the dead? It's the heart of the story. He's deeply distressed. 
He says, God has departed from me. He really believes this. There's two fallacies that come out in this story that Saul really believes that brings us to the heart of why he's here. Fallacy number one, Saul really believes that God has forsaken him. He says, God has departed from me. He won't answer me anymore. He believes there's no hope of reconciliation, reconciling his relationship with God. In other words, Saul believes that he's committed the unpardonable sin. I can't be forgiven. God will never hear my prayer. God will never answer me. This is the first fallacy. The second fallacy is that Saul believes that by using means forbidden by God, medium, spiritist, necromancy, it is actually possible to make contact with the spirits of the dead and of the dead prophet of God. So by disobeying God's direct command, he can actually make contact with one of God's greatest prophets. I mean, there's so much to deconstruct in these two fallacies. I mean, we we don't have time to do it all. But let's look at them briefly one at a time. The first fallacy, that God had forsaken him and there was no hope of reconciliation. Here's five biblical reasons I can just list off the top of my head of why I believe that this is an outrageously unbiblical idea. That God would forsake him and there was no hope of reconciliation. If you're a note taker, I'm going to go quickly and you can jot these down. Deuteronomy 30 verses 1 through 4 tells us that no matter how far Israel would go in rebellion, if they would repent and come back to God, he would forgive and restore them. 1 Samuel 12, 22, at Saul's coronation, God said, the Lord will not forsake his people. That's number two. Number three, we have the benefit of some more Bible verses that Saul didn't have in his day. But Isaiah 55, 7, one of the beautiful ones. It says, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thought. Let him return unto the Lord and the Lord will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. That's number three. Number four, Ezekiel 33, 11. Beautiful promise. It says, the Lord has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. What is the Lord after? He says, if you would just turn from your wicked way, you can live. Here's the fifth. Really like this one. As I was studying the story of King Saul, I came across another story of a king. In fact, this was Israel, or the most wicked king who ever reigned from Jerusalem. His name was King Manasseh. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 33, it tells us that King Manasseh did some incredibly wicked things that God was not happy with. In addition to everything else he did, it says he used witchcraft and sorcery, and he consulted mediums and spiritists to contact the dead. It says he did everything evil in the sight of the Lord that Saul had done before him and some if you read the account in, first, in 2 Chronicles 33. But here's the second part of this story that's so beautiful. In Manasseh, wicked king Manasseh's moment of crisis, he was captured by his enemies, he was greatly distressed, and it says that in that moment it tells us that he turned to the Lord And he prayed to the Lord and asked for forgiveness. He repented of his sins. And it says that the Lord heard his prayer, accepted it, and not only forgave Manasseh, but restored his kingdom to him. I mean, if God would do that for once wicked King Manasseh, of course he would do the same thing for King Saul. But here's the thing. When Saul was crying out to God for help, he didn't receive any answer. He found it easy to despair. He felt hopeless And he really believed that there was no hope of reconciling with God. But while there is life, there's hope. I want you to say that with me. While there's life, there is hope. See, here's the thing. All right, my beautiful wife, Capreet Shires, when I go home, if I were to go home one day to her and I would walk into the house and I would say, hey, dear, how are you? And I would go to kiss her and she turned away from me and gave me the silent treatment. Now, I'm not saying that has ever happened before. But if I were to go into the house and walk in and she would be silent to everything I try to say to her, you know what I would realize? Something's not right. And I would start thinking, I must have done something to mess up the relationship. Something really wrong is going on here. And I need to think of what it is so we can make it right, so we can reconcile. And so if I pretend like there's no problem and I just go on and let's talk about the day, she might walk into the other room and the silence would continue. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. See some heads nodding out there. I got to realize that there is a problem. And then I've got to work to make the problem right so that we can have happy and healthy communication again. 
And what Saul's trying to do is he's trying to go on and pretend like his relationship with God is okay. He's ignoring the fact that he has not repented of all of his turning aside from the word of the Lord. And he's just saying, Lord, help me, Lord, help me, Lord, help me. But there's silence because he has not yet addressed the problem and repented of the problem in his life. So I believe if Saul had truly repented like King Manasseh later did, we would have a very different ending to his tragic story. Let's look at the second fallacy briefly. He really believed that he could, through a medium, make contact with the spirits of the dead. Now, here's the amazing thing. As I did research over this story, I found that nearly every single uh, well-esteemed Bible commentary that I, that I uh, reviewed all, almost all of them concluded that this was really the spirit of the prophet Samuel who came to visit Saul. They each had their own reasons why they concluded that, but they all believed that it was really Samuel who was channeled through the sorcery of a medium in Endor. And I realized as I was preparing this that this story is confusing for a lot of Christians. And so, as I look at this story, here's five reasons I want to share with you why I believe that that idea, that this is really the spirit of the dead prophet Samuel, is also an outrageously unbiblical idea. I know Pastor Nick has already covered with you um, some topics on what the Bible teaches on death, so we don't don't need to go through all of that. You've already had a great sermon on that not that long ago. But let me just share with you five brief reasons of why I believe it's an outrageously unbiblical idea that this is really Samuel. The first is, as Pastor Nick covered a few weeks back, over 50 times in the Bible, the Bible refers to death as what? Sleep. Sleep. Jesus consistently did this in the New Testament. In fact, in in Daniel 12, verse 2, very interesting verse. It says that both the dead and the, uh, that the dead, both the righteous and wicked, are now asleep until the resurrection. That's what Daniel believed. Here's a second reason. Psalms 146 verse 4 says that in the day of death, the thoughts cease. They perish. And Ecclesiastes 9, 4 through 6 says the dead don't know anything. Their love, their envy, their hatred, it's all perished. It's all gone. And it says that they have nothing more to do with anything that goes on under the sun. This couldn't have been the prophet Samuel because the dead have nothing to do with coming back and having to do with anything that goes on under the sun. But here's another one. Number three, Revelation 118. You know what this verse tells us? That the keys of death and hell are not in the hands of familiar spirits or mediums or necromancers, but whose hands are they in? Our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible consistently considers any attempt to try and communicate with the dead to be a sin. Number four. There's so many internal contradictions in this story. I could just go on and on all day. Why does it keep saying that Samuel came up from the ground? I mean, sh- shouldn't the most righteous, greatest prophet of God be coming down? They keep saying he's coming up, up from the ground. Wait, this, okay, it doesn't make sense. All right, number two, how come a medium who God says don't have anything to do with could have the power to bring the spirit of Samuel back when Saul was, when God was not communicating with Saul through the acceptable means of communication. No, it just doesn't make any sense. Why would God allow the spirit medium to have this, this power? He wouldn't. And 1 Samuel 28 verse 3 says that the imposter Samuel says this, Saul, tomorrow you're going to die and you and your sons are going to be with me. <sighs> Wait a minute. So, He's saying that both the righteous and the wicked are going to be in the same place in the afterlife? That's an incredibly unbiblical idea. It's not true. There's so many. I could just go on, but we don't have time for all those contradictions. But here's one of the strongest reasons I believe it could not be the prophet Samuel. Jot this one down. 1 Chronicles 10, 13, and 14. The summary of the end of King Saul's life. It says, so Saul died for his unfaithfulness which he had committed against the Lord. We know this. He was very unfaithful. And because he did not keep the word of the Lord, and also because he consulted with a medium for guidance. But he did not inquire of the Lord. That's 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 10 and 13. That's important. 
The Bible makes it very clear just in that passage alone that what Saul did that day was a sin and that it was not really the spirit of Samuel who came back delivering the word of the Lord. He didn't, he didn't get word from the Lord, it says. God had nothing to do with any of it. The Bible gives us a better explanation for what it really was. You read through the scriptures, it tells us there's a powerful enemy. His name is Satan. He's a fallen angel. as many other fallen angels who are at work to deceive and destroy as many as they can in the world. In the New Testament, it says that there are seducing spirits. Paul mentions this in 1 um, Timothy verse, chapter 4, verse 1. And it calls these seducing spirits the spirits of devils. Revelation 16, 13 says that there are unclean spirits who go out to deceive. And it says that these are the spirits of devils. The Bible warns us not to in any way attempt to communicate with the dead because we would really be communicating not with a dead loved one or with a dead individual or their spirit. We would be communicating with a fallen angel impersonating the dead. Summarizing the story, the story of King Saul, it's really a tragedy. He shut the door of his heart to the spirit of God because obedience was too great of an inconvenience. When in desperation, he realized he needs God's help. He tried knocking on the door of heaven, but without repentance, there was no answer, only the echo of his own knock. The door was open to Saul, but the answer that he found when he knocked on the door of the void of the bottomless pit only brought hopelessness and despair into his life. Just like King Saul, there have been many throughout history who have knocked on the doorway into the void and many have received an answer back, yes. But that answer never comes with true joy or peace or satisfaction. I want to invite the praise team to come forward and as, we, as I conclude, I want to turn back to you. What about you? Some of you might be in the midst of a crisis in your life today. You might feel disconnected from God and alone. It's more common than you think. More people than, than I, I really thought before I became a pastor go through this experience of feeling like God could never forgive them. They've gone too far. They've committed the unpardonable sin. As a minister of the gospel, I need to remind you today that that is not true. It's a lie from Satan. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Does he say 25% of the unrighteousness? Does he say 50% of the unrighteousness? Does he say 99%? He says how much? All of the unrighteousness. Tell me what is not included in all of the unrighteousness that he can forgive you of. God will not forsake his people is what the Bible says. How can you be sure? Because the gospel tells us so. It says that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And if that wasn't enough for you, we have the visualization of Jesus hanging upon the cross and as he's there, he experiences the weight of our sins upon him. And in that moment, he experiences the hiding of his father's face. He experiences the separation that sin causes in his relationship with God. Jesus had experienced the hiding of his father's face so that one day soon you and I can see his father face to face. He experienced the separation, the forsaking of his father's presence so that you and I would realize we never will be forsaken of the Lord. The Lord will never forsake his people. And that's true for you. As Jesus looked down 2,000 years ago and saw you and I, he was forsaken so that you and I would never have to be he experienced what we deserve so that he could give us what he deserves. And that's the truth. If you'll only believe it and accept it and ask for forgiveness, he will forgive you and accept you and cleanse you and restore you. And anytime Satan comes to remind you of your past, all you need to do is what? Remind him of his future. It's a lie. All he's trying to do is kill, steal, kill, and destroy. Back to my story in Brooklyn. We're gonna end right here. When my alarm went off the next morning, I don't know when I fell asleep, but I know the first thing on my mind. The lights were now coming, the sunlight, morning sunlight shining in through the windows. It wasn't quite as scary as it was the night before. So I moved my barricade, cautiously opened my door. The hallway was empty. Went out into the hallway, walked down the hallway to that room and I got to the doorway, still open. <sighs> there were lights coming through the windows. 
walked into the doorway. It was empty. No one was there, no sign that anyone had even been in there the night before. So you can be sure I did my detective work. I went and asked everybody else who was staying in this building if they knew anything about somebody who was on the third floor that night. And I have to tell you, it's still a mystery to this day. But here's the thing, as I, at the end of the three weeks, was in the car driving out of New York City with my team. As I crossed over the last bridge and I saw green pastures and I saw cattle, livestock, grazing in those green pastures, I remembered that night and I remembered that promise, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall know and he makes me to lie down in green pastures. And I remembered that in my moment of crisis, the Lord had been true to his promise. He was with me and I needn't fear no evil because the Lord will not forsake his people. I want you to say that with me. The Lord will not forsake his people. Amen. If you're glad to be chosen and not forsaken this morning, will you join us as we sing this song? question. If you want more of God in your life, I want you to raise your hand with me right now as we pray. It doesn't matter whether you know you're connected and you just say, Lord, fill me more, or if you felt disconnected this last week, this last month, this last year. We're raising our hands, Father, to you because we believe your promise. 
Jesus was forsaken so we don't have to be. You said you will never forsake your people. And so in our own lives today, Lord, I ask that you would drive away Satan and his doubts and his discouragement from our lives. I ask that you would fill us with your fullness, with your love, your joy, your peace. And may we shine out and draw others to you to desire to have any void in their life filled with you as well. I ask that you would bless this congregation, bless this church. May it be a place where people come weekly to be filled by you. And we thank you for that promise. You will never forsake us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. It's been a pleasure to be with you today. Whether you're joining us online or here, God bless. Church family, before we depart today, uh, we just want to extend just our warmest thoughts towards Brother OJ, Nick's dad. We're so grateful that you've been with us and been visiting with us. How many of you can say you've been blessed by Brother OJ being here and spending time with us this summer? He's a great goalkeeper. I've seen his skills uh, on the soccer fields. And I know he's been a blessing to Pastor Nick and, and Beck and, and spending time with the grandkids and giving them some date nights. Uh, so just want to, uh, again, just we hope that you come back soon. We know that he's traveling this week. And so as you go out, be sure to send some love uh, and over to Brother OJ as he's departing us this week. And we hope to have you back soon. of your heart